Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. Welcome to Smart Talk. This is Zhang Xi from Tsinghua University and Jin University. It is my honor to chair the first Smart Talk given by Professor Lang. Smart Talk is a series of online lectures organized by the editorial team of the Journal of Supermolecular Materials with Professor Shi Feng as the editor-in-chief, published by Kei Publishers. It is aimed to promote the research on supermolecular materials, which are of dynamic, stimuli-responsive, reversible, and uh, even self-healing properties. This kind of materials are definitely needed for sustainable society. The Smart Talk is usually arranged on Friday afternoon or evening, and the speakers will be famous scientists engaged in supermolecular science. It is our great pleasure to invite Professor Len from the University of Strasbourg in France to deliver the first Smart Talk. I don't think that I need to waste time for introducing Professor Len. He's uh, widely worldwide as the father of uh, supermolecular chemistry, received the Nobel Prize of Chemistry in 1987. Interestingly, one of his uh, early PhD students, Professor Savage, also received the Nobel Prize of Chemistry in 2016. Therefore, he's uh, not only a great scientist, but also a great teacher. The title of Professor Lane's talk is Traverse Dynamic Functional Materials. Let's welcome Professor Lane and the online stage is yours, please. So it's my pleasure to have this occasion to be again in China, unfortunately, only through my screen. At this time of the year, I normally am in China, but for two years now, no way. It wasn't possible, unfortunately. And I hope very much that next year it will be possible to see my friends there. Especially, I would like to thank Shang Shi for being, uh, for running, for being the manager, for being the director, the president of this lecture. And uh, he's a good friend, and I'm very happy to see him there. But unfortunately, it would be better to be together and have a good drink or have a good dinner or something like that. <laughs> Maybe next year. Oh, next year. Let's do that next year. <laughs> okay, so um, I have selected uh, topics which are related, of, uh, which are on supramolecular materials, sometimes a little bit different, just to show other things which are close to it. I will not talk much about dynamic materials which are not supramolecular, but which are normally, that's molecular materials. Uh, and uh, I would also like to be to say that I am very happy to be on this, to be with this journal, Supramolecular Materials, which is uh, published in China and uh, for the whole world, as they say, which is quite nice. And uh, so, um, this is my topic will be dynamic materials towards dynamic functional materials. But as I said, this will be mostly considering the supramolecular materials. So molecular chemistry deals with molecular materials. And then of course, supramolecular chemistry deals with supramolecular materials. What are they? They are formed usually by self-assembly through non-covalent interactions, and they involve, in uh, almost in all cases, just because of the interactions, molecular recognition processes. And now, supramolecular chemistry, as all of you know, is a, a chemistry which deals with molecular recognition, and where the formation of materials is uh, directed by molecular recognition. And can consider two main areas in supramolecular chemistry. One of them, which deals with supramolecular discrete assemblies. That means entities which are uh, well uh, specified, well 
considered in terms and will uh, have a number of components which are uh, very limited and well known. On the other hand, extended organized assemblies are really what one might call supramolecular materials. The first ones are supramolecular entities, supramolecules, if you wish, and the materials are extended assemblies. They can be one dimensional, like a chain, two dimensional, like a cross links of chains uh, or uh, on surfaces, on interfaces, films, and three dimensional soft matter types, gels, micelles, liquid crystals, but also a solid is a supramolecular entity because a solid exists because of the interactions between the constituents of the solid, crystal engineering, and so on. So a property which I want to right at the beginning mentioned, but it has been mentioned also already in the introduction, is that supramolecular chemistry is a dynamic chemistry because the non uh, the non-covalent interactions are libile, they are reversible. This has a consequence. The consequence is that they can undergo adaptation through changes in their constitution by exchanging pieces, by incorporating other pieces uh, into the supramolecular entity. So this is what I may call a dynamic non-covalent chemistry. This leads then to dynamic materials, which may be adaptive because they are, can undergo these exchanges. So this is something which can, will come all along the talk, not in our places, but all along. But you will also add to that another facet, which is the dynamic covalent chemistry a little bit later because I will need it. So I want first to give a very brief, very brief aspect of what can be sort of complicated supramolecular assemblies, which are discrete, discrete entities, and which are obtained by, uh, like a, uh, um, an organic molecular chemist deals with reactions and so on, manipulating reactions. Uh, in supramolecular chemistry, you manipulate the non-covalent interactions. I give you just a few, this is rather old, uh, most of it, but it's interesting just to have a quick look. So one can make uh, extended uh, supramolecular strands. Now this strand is not just discrete because that's a very long, it's one like a polymer. It's a sort of a supramolecular polymer. But uh, I mentioned it because by changing the head group, here you have head groups, which binds together and generate these strands. Uh, one can also force the system to uh, give a ring rather than a strand. And this is the case when you use other types of molecular species, molecular bricks, which then leads to, an, uh, which then enforce the assembly in a circle, like this supramolecular macrocycle, which has six molecular uh, fragments which build it up. The building blocks are six molecular fragments, and this yields the supramolecular macrocycle. Uh, incidentally, there's a, a crystal structure, one of those is known, which has been done by uh, the Mark Mascal, who was at some, uh, one stage a postdoc, he was now a professor in California. Then uh, another type is uh, very well known, has been developed quite a lot, is the combination of triamino triazine, melamine, and cyanuric acid. As you can see, they have three phases. There are three phases. The three phases are identical. So this is something which can make rather complex entities. And again, this is not a discrete one. This is just to show that you can use these building blocks, melamine and cyanuric acid, to uh, make for instance, the type of uh, objects which uh, White Sides and his group have uh, studied. We have also worked on similar type of entities. And a very nice illustration is the one that done by David Reinhardt in uh, the Netherlands, when he made these rosettes shown here. Um, and then the, he made double rosettes with different sizes and tetra rosettes where four rosettes are linked together. This is just to show you that one can make interesting discrete entities, but all this is rather early stuff. 
Now, we have more recently had the chance to have another one, which is shown here. This compound, which is on the top here, you will see it again because it also has been used for supermolecular polymers. But it has been used a lot by uh, uh, Andy Hamilton, who was my, also my former postdoc. He's now president of uh, New York University, like Xi Shang is president of Jilin University. Yeah? So uh, he's president of New York University. And we got some strange uh, NMRs and all that, reversible type. Uh, but we couldn't know what was really going on until we could crystallize it. And a very long work was done by, thanks to the Professor Dick, uh, Professor Fenske, uh, Dieter Fenske from Karlsruhe, who is also uh, in uh, our group, which we have in uh, Guangzhou. Um, uh, finally, it turned out it's a hexamer and a very complex thing. You see here, this was very difficult to predict. We didn't know what was going on. And thanks to the crystal structure, we found out. That, so this is, if you wish, this is a good characterization of what is a discrete uh, supramolecular object where the molecule, the number of molecules defined, the way they get together is well defined, and it is limited in space. And you can see that this is a very complicated one. It wouldn't be possible to sort of uh, make it into the form the NMR spectra and so on are very symmetric because all these molecules, uh, they, are, they, have this, they are the same in this thing, which is rather strange. But that's the why. That's what you uh, what we obtained. Okay, so this is this was to do has to do with discrete supramolecular entities. So what about then supramolecular materials? Now supramolecular materials are based on the molecular components, which are linked by reversible non-covalent connections. That means they can break easily and reassemble. They then generate dynamic materials, which can be self-healing, responsive. They have new properties, which other materials do not have. They can self-heal, they can respond to the environment, and they then make, they open the door to the development of adaptive materials. A category, and a very important category of such materials is, of course, polymers. So supramolecular polymers will be a big part of my talk. What are they? Supramolecular polymers are represented here in the middle of the screen, where two molecular entities fitted at each end with recognition groups can link together in a complementary fashion. The yellow recognition group is complementary to the red one, and then it gives a supramolecular polymeric chain where the, con the connection between the chains are of non-covalent type and therefore are reversible. Um, these dynamic polymers can also be called dynamers. This is more general. They can be supramolecular or molecular. We will see that later. And so let's have first a look at supramolecular polymer chemistry. I here mention a review. There have been many reviews on that. We have also, I have written a number of reviews, chapters in books. There are, there are two books by Sifiri. Uh, which uh, very early on, quite early on in the field. And there's a very good review by the group of uh, Xi Chang, yes, in chemical reviews in 2015. That's a very, quite a complete review uh, in a time more recent than the others. And so I think if you want to have some more knowledge about this field, you should look up that review. But let me continue. Now, before we had really supramolecular polymers main chain ones, we had studied in 1989 uh, the, the simple binding between a diamidopyrimidine and uracil derivative with long chains. Now, both of them are solids which melt, and when you mix them, like is shown schematically on the bottom, when you mix them, they get together and they yield then an iso um, a liquid crystalline phase, a beta stable mesomorphic phase, uh, in this isotropic at, uh, at the, with a melting point of 82 degrees. And so these were supramolecular liquid crystals, which was sort of the beginning of these polymers. This was the first paper where we looked at just two of them binding together. How does that work? The studies which have been performed indicated 
that two of such things, two of such units, get together side by side, make a sort of a disk, and the disk then gives a column. So that's another type, which we see, see again, another type of supramolecular uh, arrangement where there are disks on disk, on disk, on disk, stacking on top of each other. And this was the first case, but we will see others a bit later. Uh, it was therefore also, as we called it at that time, a, a macroscopic expression of molecular recognition. The formation of the, of the metastable mesomorphic phase was, in fact, a way to show that they had interacted and therefore had bound together in a supramolecular way. But then the main chain supramolecular polymers started in our hands with the having chiral complementarity complementary H-bonding components. We used tartaric acid at the center here. You see it here at the, in the middle of this. Uh, this is one of the units. And it is fitted at each end with a, re a recognition group. There are the two identical recognition group, one at each end. This one is a solid. The middle, as I said, is tartaric acid. And in order to give it solubility properties, the, the OHs of tartaric acid were functionalized by a long chain C12H25, as you see on the bottom. The complement to this first one, what should it be? In this recognition group, it's a donor, an acceptor, and a donor of hydrogen bonds. The complement is, of course, an acceptor, donor acceptor. ADA is complementary to DAD. And that's a derivative of uracil. This is also a solid. And then when you mix them together, what do you expect? You expect to obtain a linear chain, a supramolecular chain, where the units are linked together by three hydrogen bonds, as we show here, you see here. This is now a liquid crystal. The starting materials, the molecules, separately were solids. And when you mix them, you get a liquid crystal, which is a sort of what you may call an emerging property, a property which comes from the fact that you have mixed the, these two entities and they then form this supramolecular type of chain. I should here also mention the very important work done in the laboratory of Bert Meyer in Eidhoven. I just saw him two weeks ago, where they introduced this UP, uh, the well-known now UP group, Urate, uh, ureido, sort of a, uh, a urea on one end, and then a pyrimidinone on the other hand, which is now much used, and we will see it again also. This, this work of the, the group in Eindhoven added a lot to this field of supramolecular polymers, like also did the work in Antigua University, of course. Now, um, th but that's not all. I would like to indicate what, because if you analyze in detail this thing which we had done in 1990, then in fact, it turns out, and this was a little work a little bit later shows that in fact, first of all, the first step is to add together the two molecular components. This then forms a supramolecular chain. So the molecular components form the supramolecular chain by hydrogen bonding, a triple hydrogen bonding. But that's not enough. Analyzing the X-ray uh, structures, the, uh, the X-ray scattering, it was found that, in fact, three of such strands wrap around the axis of a cylinder. So it's a sort of a cylinder where three, three um, chains wrap around. It's a triple helix, which is formed, where these, these uh, things in the middle here represent each time a dimer between uh, the, part, the, the pairing up of the diamidopyridine with the uracil. And I have already represented one of such chains at the bottom and the three on top. This center, the, the, um, the cylinder itself has a diameter of about 15 angstroms. And the C12H25 chains, they stick out so that the whole thing has a diameter of about 40 angstrom. So this is only one step. The next step comes up is the following, is that, that the excess chains which stick out of the cylinder, they can entangle, they can link together, entangle, and therefore bind together and form these very nice fibers 
as shown by electron microscopy. Uh, I have not put uh, uh, the, the dimensions, but the, uh, the diameter of one of these, the smallest of these fibers is about 40 angstroms. And you see, this is quite nice. This is a very long, these fibers are very long. So in fact, what it means also is that we go from the nanoscale to the microscale all the way from molecules to supermolecular chain, then to a triple helix and then to fibers. This in itself is quite interesting because it also bridges the molecular state with the macroscopic state of uh, having fibers formed. Now, uh, we studied a bit more this thing, and this is old stuff also, but I thought many of you haven't seen it probably. You can then look at what happens as the concentration changes. When it is very dilute, then you get just dots. You can call that nucleation dots, nuclei. When you're more concentrated, you have fire, you have sort of change which grow, you have a you have a filament here. And then when you concentrate it more, then you get a sort of a tree. I call that a tree. By letter association, you get these nice, rather nice pictures. And when you have it even more concentrated, you get a fiber, which you can see on the right. The other thing of interest is that you can, since there's tartaric acid in the middle, you can also play with the chiralidity. If you mix L L, tartaric acid derivatives, the fibers obtained are right-handed helices. As you can see here on the left, the helix is right-handed. When you mix the DD, you expect and you get left-handed helices. As you double helix, triple, as that should be, a, it's more complicated, it's more than a double or triple helix, it's a much larger, it's the fibrils, and it's much more uh, developed. But if you use the meso, not surprisingly, you get no helix. You get just patches, you get a material, but it's not helical. Then the last thing I would like to point out, which was also done in this early work in 1993, a long time ago, when you mix together all of the uh, objects, that means the, um, uh, the, uh, all the, the, the L's and the D's all together, then what happens? What happens is, in fact, you get superhelical structures which show LL, DD, and regions which have a mixed handedness where the arrows are here, but they are still, still helical. You can see where the arrows are. You have here a, a right handed and here left handed. Here also, you have this, this type of thing here, has a P, it shows some left, left handed and right handed. So there is a, a chirality recognition but you can have one and the other together, and then they can bind together probably by the lateral entangling. But it, so in other words, here you get sort of strange uh, objects where two probably triple helix helices of the LL and DD type will then mix together and form a, a mixed handedness of LL heli triple helices and DD he triple helices. It's not all that easy to get it, but you see it on the, on, the on the electron microscopy, you see it quite nicely. Now, one thing I wanted also to say about that, this is a very important application of these supermolecular entities. And I think it's worth for all of us who are mostly, of course, interested and doing at the beginning basic science, but also is very happy when something uh, applied comes out of it. As I indicated, supermolecular polymers, our first paper was in 1990. So it took a long time for coming to an application. But what happened is the following. A small company in the Netherlands, in fact, in Eindhoven, using the type of a head group which had been introduced by Bert Meyer, they made then uh, biocompatible polymers. And these this were developed by this small company, Xeltis, to make a material which could be used for cardiovascular implants in children who had a severe congenital cardiac malformation and requiring a cardiac reconstruction. And indeed, this was brought to the clinic and I got this fantastic email, I remember that very well. On the 23rd of October, 2013, I got an email from the Xentis people and here it is, this young girl, Dominica at that time, four years old, was uh, was treated 
her heart was reconstruction. She had only she had only one ventricle, only one heart with only one vent ventricle, and so she had to be reconstructed. Uh, and uh, the heart was reconstructed by this very famous pediatric su uh, surgeon Leo Bokeria uh, at the uh, Bakudev Scientific Center for Cardiovascular Surgery in Moscow on October 23rd, 2013. This is the picture that day. You see, both are very happy. She's very happy because, okay, she's in much better shape now, and he's very happy because it worked. And we were very, very happy also to see that, to see now that supramolecular polymers had been used to correct the heart of this young girl. She's now seven years older, eight years older, and uh, she's fine, and many others have been implanted, many more than 10. The same company made also pulmonary heart valves, which you see here. In fact, the person, one, the, one of the, the, the technologies, the, the CTO, the, the, um, uh, the technical officers, officer of the, um, of the company came, just he was in, uh, in my lab just uh, two, 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 years, two weeks ago, and he showed me also these valves. They look very nice, and they have now been implanted also in children in Budapest, in Krakow, and Kuala Lumpur, and I think probably other places too. So that seems to be, they tell me, a breakthrough in surgical practice. I wanted also to use it, first of all, to tell you that, of course, we were very happy with it, Basic research has led to a very practical, a very important application. And also it shows you that despite the fact that it took 23 years to do that, if you knew at the beginning that it will take 23 years, you would be a bit discouraged. But once it happens, one is very happy. And it also shows, I use it always as an example to say that basic research with the help of all the other uh, researchers, engineers, and of course, financiers around the world finally comes to important applications. Now, this is another type of um, uh, main chain polymer. I just show it by, for illustration, uh, where there are sextuple hydrogen bonding. I have shown you three, which was the initial one, uh, and then four with the, the Bert Meyer one, and it's the sextuple one, where six hydrogen bonds are formed between the red unit and the blue unit. Uh, and of course, then you can course link it by adding a, a ternary unit like shown here, and so on and so on. This is described in that paper, I you have a reference in Chem European Journey 2002. Uh, the, uh, these things are sort of uh, quite interesting and together with the group of Paolo Samori in our institute, uh, they deposited it on the surface and looked at what was seen, what you could see, because we wanted also to see these polymers. And in fact, when you look at it, you can, uh, on the top of the STM image, you can then put these entities, which have the sex triple hydrogen bondings as shown here. So this was done quite later, about 10 years later at least. Oh no, more than that, it's uh, 15 years later. But okay, it was very nice to, uh, have to see that and to see finally these supramolecular polymers by STM imaging. Now, what else? These were, and this was very, very short, of course, because there are many other things one can talk about. But um, uh, what about another type of supramolecular polymer, which is in fact not a chain, but a column? And uh, this was here uh, done in the following way. This unit, which was this uh, hydrogen derivative uh, of uh, also a benzoic acid with the hydrazine, this can undergo a tautomerization and the tautomers can then bind together. They can, they can they form a, a recognition feature, a recognition pattern, which leads to a trimer shown here. So the initial unit, a sector is uh, is in totomeric equilibrium, and this totomerism can occur and forms this unit here, which then can bind together with two others, each one with two others, leads this trimer, this supramolecular trimer, which is this disc, and then the disc piles up, stacks on top of each other, the disc stack, and leave, leave this column. So initially, there is a sector which goes a disc, and this is necessary before you can get the column. 
So it's a sort of a, a conditional type of process where first the disk has to be formed and then the column can form. This is something which is quite interesting in many cases. In another type of uh, type of work, I would uh, tell you about, but uh, this uh, I haven't time to do that today. Now let me have a look at something else, where again a supramolecular macrocycle is being formed. This was using guanines. Now guanines were known by biophysicists and biologists very well to form a quartet. Guanine quartets. This guanine quartet is shown in the middle here. You can see a guanine on the left-hand side. It forms a quartet shown here. Such quartets result from hydrogen bonding and they are stabilized. That is well known by biophysicists. It was much before. This was well known uh, a long time ago. And in fact, let me just mention that maybe you so so have followed it. These quartets are very important at the ends of chromosomes. Uh, this is one, in fact, one of the Nobel Prizes had to do with the telomeres, the telomeres which are the end of the chromosomes, which are very rich in uh, G, in guanines, and then form these quartets at the end of chromosome. I haven't time to get more into it. And once these things are formed, they can again stack on top of each other and give this column. So from the guanine, you get a quartet, and then it can stack. We will see that again. But here, what I want to get at is to take a molecular monomer having two guanines, so they can form a quartet at each end. The result of that is that you get a gel, which, is, which can be transformed into solution or gel, depending on whether or not, as you can see here, you need this potassium to stabilize the gel. And this, make, this helps to stabilize it. This potassium ion is bound in the middle. And so if you start with this chain, and have here, this was a complexing agent, which we made many, many years ago. In fact, um, Xie Shang, he wrote, he just mentioned uh, Jean-Pierre Sauvage a moment ago. And Jean-Pierre Sauvage, uh, who got a Nobel Prize in 2016, when he was in my group as a PhD student, he was with Bernard Dietrich, the two students who made this type of objects, the cryptans. Now, if you mix here, the potassium ion is hidden in the cavity. What you can now do, if you add HCl to that, the, 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 this unit with the with potassium gets protonated and the potassium has to go out. This potassium ion now can stabilize the guanine quartet formation. So you get this. This is what you get by uh, liberating the potassium and then you form this hydrogel. And then if you now at base, you remove the protons from the cage, and then the cage picks up again the potassium and you go back to the chain. In other words, when the potassium is in the cage, you have just the dimer, a solution. And when the potassium gets out of the cage, you can make the hydrogel because then the G quartet is stabilized by potassium ions. Let me just show you that here. You see here on top, you have an example where here on here by the, the famous experiment of turning the, the tube upside down. You can here see here, this is a gel. It's on the top because it sticks on the top. And then you, you ch can change it into the soil, back to the gel, back to the soil. And it is simply done, done gel. Then you add the complexing agent, get a solution. You add acid, then the potassium goes on to get a gel again, soil, gel, and so on. So you can modulate the uh, gel soil state by acid and base. In other words, you know, it's a sort of a molecular machine also, if you wish. I mean, it's not a machine, but this is a change in the, the material by modulating it through the energy of uh, binding the potassium ion and the neutralization H plus by OH minus giving water. Now, let's go to uh, some supramolecular polymers, which involve also um, co covalent bonds and where the uh, supramolecular interactions are multiple hydrogen bonding between the polymer chains. That means lateral supramoleculars, not linear, not in this, not this, the, um, the hydrogen bonding is not along the chain, but is perpendicular. So this was done by one of my postdocs, Navarro Roy. I cannot cite everybody, but you can see some references. 
And um, the interesting thing is that if you use this di, this uh, the diamino urea, or let's say a hydrazine derived uh, from uh, from a CO from the, from from uh, phosphine, for instance. This compound is very easy to get. And uh, what is known is that you can then easily make out of this tris urea. If you treat it with an isocyanate, you get three ureas. One, two, three. Now, what is important to know, and that is quite interesting, is that when you have a hydrazine with acyl groups here, the, this, this amide, and oh, let's say this urea and this urea, are in perpendicular planes. They are not flat, they are perpendicular. Because and this was something we had studied much, much, much earlier in 1965 or something like that. And then um, uh, you, when uh, the, the uh, object here is perpendicular, which means that, as you can see, the solid state structure of this object, which is just a model, you can see that you have here bending, the chains are are perpendicular, this urea is perpendicular to that one, the first one is perpendicular to the second one, which is perpendicular to the third one. And all of this then makes possible forming here the array of hydrogen bonds, which is a double uh, two hydrogen bonds two in, in, at two positions in the molecule. And this then leads to, uh, you can use then to make these polymers to give them to make them something different than a solid, but to make them uh, soft matter, you can use a dimethyloxane chain as shown here. This, you mix it with that, then you get this thing, which is a sort of a very soft, not very interesting in terms of these properties, but it's, it's a soft material. Uh, and then this undergoes self-feeding. For instance, out of these things, uh, out of this material, depending on the number of uh, silicon dimethyloxane units you have, you can make sort of pieces of mat material. You can then cut it in two. You then press them together and they then they heal. This section then heals up and you get this self-healing type of uh, property. Again, we, uh, we have not tried here to make something nice for use and so on, but just to demonstrate the self-healing properties. Uh, the similar things can be done in other ways, but let me show you a very interesting uh, an interesting case. Uh, it was done by the same person, Baron Roy. Uh, this is uh, isocyanate, which is very easy to get, very easy to make. I think you can even buy it. And this is just the uh, the piece hydrazide of succinic acid, of uh, the P5 uh, as the uh, C5 diacid. When you mix them together, you get now uh, a chain where you have a very large number of hydrogen bonding possibilities. Let's have a look. First of all, this high density of hydrogen bonding sites resides in several groups. First of all, a bis acyl hydrazine, represented here in this red rectangle. Then you can identify that the, among this, there's a urea. Here is a urea. Of course, that is part of the, uh, the other one, but just to, to, to dissect what is going on. And finally, there's a urethane here. So this unit has a high density of hydrogen bonding sites located in several functional groups. Some physical properties are shown here on the left for those who are interested. So this is just, I have a film, but it was a bit difficult to bring it because usually then you, are, you spend a lot of time on that. But let me just show you uh, what happens. If you make this transparent film, so this material, which I just showed you, gives a very nice transparent film. You see it here, this transparent film. You see, it's very nice. It is totally transparent. It does not deform. And this is why we, uh, we have it show it here. These are the fingers of Dabarun Roy, and somebody else is then cleaving, cutting this film in two pieces. Then you superimpose the two ends, you press with your finger in the middle, and you get then the transparent film here, uh, which sticks together and has healed, as you can see here, healing. So... Now, this way, you know, I can't, don't want just to go into these properties. So that's very simple. Huh? It's a, and it's, it worked even after two years, 
it still worked. The film was had still the same properties. We tried it and never tried it. Other type is uh, quickly uh, a unit where again we used the tartaric acid units. We put on each side this uh, this uh, cyanuric acid type and the melamine type, and this is now a two day uh, a two D array of self assembling. Uh, you can see here that when you have a double headed unit, then you can get this uh, uh, extension in two dimensions, this way, up, down, and also left, right. Uh, I would like just to show you that materials, of course, materials of many times, but one type of material is a liposome. A liposome is a sort of a soft matter entity which defines a bilayer membrane which like a, like a living, like a cell, a biological cell, which has an outside and an inside, inside water, outside water. And if you name, now make lipids, which have recognition groups at the end, uh, which are complementary, the red one is complementary to the right one, then you can make vesicles which are built on the red one, vesicles built on the, uh, the green one, so the red and the green. One is uh, the... Um, Triamino, uh, this triaminopyrimidine or triaminotriazine, depending on what one uses. And the other one is a barbituric acid derivative. We call that TAP bar, uh, triaminopyrimidine barbituric acid. They interact through three hydrogen bonds. In addition, they get ionized and they have also an electrostatic interaction. Now, with this, we made these vesicles. Let me just show what happens. This is quite, quite interesting. What can happen is that if a bar and tap vesicles, when you mix them, they get into contact, okay? Now what they, they can do is to exchange the lipids and then they sort of neutralize each other and then they separate afterwards. But they can also undergo fusion. And this is very interesting because it's a process like fusion of cells, which usually require uh, rather big proteins, a uh, uh, very complex system. But this, in this case, you can do it with a simple organic molecules of super and then of the supramolecular objects. Let me show you that. So we start with the tap bar shown here on top. And then before mixing, this is the cell. This, these are the vesicles formed is one of them separately before mixing. Then you mix it with its complementary vesicle. Then they, after 10 minutes, they aggregate very strongly. As you can see here, we have aggregation. And you have already a big one, so the small ones. And then you wait, and after 24 hours, a fusion into very big ones. So you, at the beginning, these units, the, sim the separated ones, are stable. When you mix, they aggregate, and they, they fuse. And this is uh, can be of interest for targeting a drug delivery. Uh, another type of experiment, which just shows you what one can do, if you use a quartz crystal microbalance, uh, which is represented here, and then you deposit on top uh, on top of it layers of these lipids, and you inject the complementary uh, vesicles on the bottom. Then they attach to the surface, and they, the more they attach, the quartz, quartz micro quartz this QCM quartz crystal microbalance will tell you what is the amount of material which attaches. And here you can see that if you have a film which is formed of triaminopyrimidine of TAP, if you inject bar vesicles, they bind, as the Q QCM shows you. But if you inject the same, that means the vesicles which are TAP vesicles, they cannot bind and they do not bind. Them. TAP vesicles don't bind to the TAP the films on the, on the, on the QCM. Whereas bar vesicles, they bind, and you see that, that they bind here by this increase in weight. This is just based on the frequency of the, this is, a, for those who don't know about the technology, it uses the frequency of the quartz crystal. Um, yes, now the next step comes. What about transferring the properties of supramolecular chemistry the dynamic properties of supramolecular chemistry into molecular chemistry. You, that means you want to import dynamics into molecular chemistry by introducing reversible covalent bonds. This is the way in which you can make, you can give the ability of molecular entities to undergo also 
processes which are characteristic of supramolecular entities. And this then would be a dynamic covalent chemistry, which has developed very much in the last 20 years now, it's about 20 years. Uh, and uh, we had uh, worked a lot on that. We worked on that. Uh, uh, we have been so in parallel with Jeremy, no, not, with Jeremy Sanders at uh, Cambridge. Uh, we developed this thing in, part, in, in parallel at the beginning, but now it's a lot of people work on it because it's a very interesting field in itself. It's sort of giving to mole molecules some of the dynamic properties of supramolecular entities. Now, if you have dynamic covalent chemistry and dynamic non-covalent chemistry, if you want to characterize that domain as a single domain, then you can say that these two entities, the dynamic covalent uh, entities, the dynamic non-covalent ones, together they represent a type of chemistry which deals with objects, chemical objects that are dynamic in their constitution. This constitution can be a molecular constitution or a supramolecular constitution. And this then allows constitutional variation and adaptation. And that is now leading to uh, what you may call adaptive chemistry, which is now our main field of activity. So this then, this then allows the development of constitutional dynamic materials which then mean here, you can see down now this uh, on the bottom, if they are polymers, constitutional dynamic polymers, on the bottom you have this chain, where now the connections of the yellow and the red are complementary functional groups, which give a functional recognition, for instance, the condensation of a carbonyl group, like an aldehyde on the left, with the red one, which is an amine, giving an imine. So on the right-hand side, this yellow plus red is an imine double bond, okay? So that is a molecular material or a polymer, a molecular materials, molecular polymers, which are dynamic, molecular dynamic materials and polymers. And then there could also be supramolecular materials and polymers, which are dynamic. In the supramolecular one, of course, we have just seen them, then the connections here are interactions, recognition interactions. Now, um, you can, of course, combine the two, have a double dynamic entity where molecular and supramolecular are mixed together. Let's start again with this carbonyl bisheid resin. We have already seen it. And we have seen it to form tris urea. But you can now also condense that in H2 with a carbonyl. And then you get a bis imine with a urea. So it's a bis imino uh, uh, urea. Huh? This is urea group, which has hydrogen bonds. So the supramolecular and non-covalent hydrogen bonds is a double dynamic functional unit, which has these hydrogen bonds from the urea in the middle, that is supramolecular, and where the two imines are molecular covalent imine functions. The supramolecular is this urea interaction by double hydrogen bonding, which is typical of urea, and the other one is the imines here, okay? So this one here, these are the imines. So the supramolecular and the molecular. Now, uh, what you can do then is the following. You can, uh, this is, you have already seen this here, except that now at the end, we have now not an not a isocyanate, but we have a simple aldehyde. If you take now the bis aldehyde with the bis hydrazido uh, carbonyl here, or the bis amino urea, whatever you want, then you can get a double dynamer, a dynamer, a, poly, a dynamic polymer, which has double dynamicity. It is dynamic by the lateral hydrogen bonding between urea groups and by the, in the long, along the chain by the dynamics of the imines. Now, this gives said, see, that's not a very nice material, but it is one which has been formed here just to this demonstration. You can cut it, superimpose it, and it sticks again, and you can measure the rheological properties of this object. Fine, uh, uh, before I come towards the end, I'm not yet finished, but they allow me to have a longer time, so I will take advantage of that. It's very dangerous if somebody tells me that I can take a longer time, but okay. So, metallo-supramolecular polymers are also dynamic 
In fact, they are triple dynamic. And let me just, this is only a very brief thing. If we take head groups, which can bind a metal ion, like shown here. So we have the head group, the yellow unit is a ligand molecule. The red point is a metal cation. They can now be connected by making this binding unit, which is a coordination co connection. They can, be, uh, they can be dynamic in the ligand exchange because each of these yellow things, which is the ligand part, can exchange its pieces. Then the cation is then the, the ex dynamic because you can exchange the cation also. And then you can also modify the coordination centers. It can, the whole coordination center can exchange. So you can have, depending on how you do it, suppose at the bottom you can see here, you have a pyridine aldehyde, you have the urea, this, uh, sorry, this hydrazine here, that makes this acyl hydrazone type of unit where you have three binding sites, nitrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, which can be ionized if the X here is an H. So if you bind metal ions, the metal ions can bind to this ligand in a tridentate way by three interaction sites. And if you ionize, of course, then it becomes much more stable. You have cationic metallodynamous when X is H, and you have neutral ones when X is the minus charge after ionization, because then this group with a two plus metal ion gets two minus from two ligand centers, and then you have a neutral one which becomes soluble in organic solvents. Now, let me just show you mechanodynamics you can do in this case, where you have these two objects, uh, which are pretty, we are chains, which contain met metal ions, nickel here, ionized nickel, uh, and here zinc. Now, the, the one with nickel is a hard film. The long one with zinc is a gum. Now, you mix the two, you blend them together, when you mix them, they can exchange their components, they can recombine and give the kind of mixed chains which you see here. And now this is a soft film. In other words, the hard film and the gum has become a soft film, which shows that you have now the average of the two. You have a, a mechanodynamics has operated and you get now a material which is not hard, which is not a gum, but which is soft, which is between the two. The same can be demonstrated in optical, for optical properties. We start with this thing here, again, the same thing, which is non-emissive, it's dark under UV light. This one is the zinc, it's also dark, non-emissive. Now, when you mix it, you get a recombination of the whole thing, and the result is that you generate some positions where you have zinc bound between these quinolines, and this is then giving a yellow emission. This is the center which has formed thanks to these dynamic properties and gives now a yellow emission. This uh, type of, uh, this is just a demonstration. It's not ideal, of course, as you can see, but it demonstrates that uh, metallo supramolecular polymers can also form this uh, dynamic, can also present these dynamic features, giving either mechanodynamics or optodynamics. Now, let's go a step towards adaptive chemistry. What is it? Adaptation can be obtained through uh, different types of um, agents which are applied to the substance, to what you are looking at, to your material. In response, this adaptation can occur in response to different agents, which can be change in environment, a phase change, physical effect, a chemical effect, and so on and so on. Okay. And this also, as we can see a little bit later, also uh, is, happens in a constitutional dynamic network, which I will define. The adaptive chemical systems. First of all, I want to discuss briefly a polymerization, which is here in this case, uh, let's say, well, I could say it is fully, yeah, it's not totally molecular. It has supramolecular characters, but let's look at it as molecular. If you have this um, cabazole here, which is a hydrophobic core unit, on the nitrogen, you attach a hydrophilic side chain, and you have here two aldehyde groups. 
The complement to that would be to have uh, this, uh, the same thing, but at the end of it, at the two turbining, at the tur ends of the two units, you have now NH2 groups introduced as hydrazines. When you mix those together in water solution, you get, yeah, I don't want to, uh, I haven't time to explain why, but you get a chain, which is a sort of a helical rigid rod, because in aqueous solution, thermodynamics want the, they want the smallest contact between water and hydrophobic units. So the thermodynamic features of this uh, water solution, so to say, forces the substance on one hand first to polymerize, to make the imines here, as you can see, and then these wrap around so that the hydrophobic core is inside and the chains, the, hydro, the hydrophilic, the hexaglime side chain stick out. And so now, but now what is interesting is the following. If we now at this demonstrates how you can have adaptation. If we now add to this another entity, which is very similar to the one here, the one which has a cabazole core, but has a smaller core. This core, core is less hydrophobic than this one. So the thermodynamic properties of the whole system push it to continue to do the same because you want to minimize the surface contact, the contact with water with the largest lipophilic surface, which means you get the same chain, the same type of hydrophilic of, um, of a rigid rod. But then when to this object you add now the acetonitrile, then you progressively convert the pure water to an organo aqueous solution, which means as you add more acetonitrile, it becomes more and more and more organic. As a result of that, the hydrophobic, the hydrophobic uh, in the forces driving the system will not be operating so strongly anymore. So at 80% of acetonitrile, you are not now in a condition where you incorporate both the large one, the one with cabazole, and the smaller one, the one with the phenyl ring, into the polymer. You lose your selectivity, which again confirms that the initial selectivity was really due to hydrophobic adaptation. You have a component, a component selection, which makes that the system adapts to what is around. If it is pure water, it's the rod. And if it is water with uh, more and more and more uh, uh, organics, then you get, the, um, you get a mixture of incorporation. With, again, with uh, Paolo Samori's group in our institute, another, uh, another interesting experiment was performed. Here you have a long chain benzaldehyde, derivative for benzaldehyde. And we have three diamines with two carbons, six carbons, 12 carbons between the amino groups. You mix that in phenyl octane solution and you, dip, and you look at it by NMR. What you find by nucleomatic resonance is that you have just the formation of monoimines, single imines, not both imines, very little of B C means, and you have a mixture of all three, the one with two, the one with six, the one with 12 methylene groups. Then you deposit a drop of this on a surface, you let it evaporate, and you do, no, you just deposit and you look at it. And what you find then on the, on the uh, graphite surface, you get the position of only one object. The only one which you get is only a bis imine, and that bis imine is the long chain one, the A2B12. So this is very interesting because it means that the adsorption of this bis imine to this very nice, very regular um, uh, film on the, on the top of the graphite drives the reaction to completion. That means not single imine, but bis imine. And it drives also component selection. That means only the C12, not the two and the six. 
this is rather interesting. You see, this is if you if you think about it, it means that simply depositing a mixture on a surface makes whatever reaction occurs complete, and it drives a very good selection. So a simple deposition that is very highly significant. It's an adaptation to the fact that it adsorbs, and it's a sort of a self-organization. By induced by the deposition, by the surface adsorption, which drives the selection. We can even sort of claim, I don't say that what you see on this slide has anything to do with the origin of life. But what has something to do is probably the properties. The properties are that... Recording in progress. If, if you have uh, uh, um, an object, a mixture and you simply deposit this mixture on a surface, you get then a selection, which can be a very important one, a pure, sort of a purification, and you also favor the reactions between what is in the solution and which deposits them. So that is, a very, we come back to that because I think it's very important. Now, the next, the next point of interest is to consider these dynamic systems uh, as uh, networks. Why should we do that? These comp this complex systems form, in fact, networks. If an entity, if, sorry, if a number of entities, mixtures, can exchange their components, every time something happens to one of these constituents exchanging components, all the others will know what happens. If one changes, the other ones will know that it's a, there's a change. So let's start with the following. Suppose we have four components, A, A prime, B, B prime, and they can react two by two, the A's with the B's, making A, B, A, B prime, A prime, B, and A prime, B prime. This is a network, which is the simplest network, a square. And you can position A, B, A, B prime, A prime, B prime, A prime, B on the corners of the square. Now, the edges of the square, they link components, sorry, constituents which are antagonistic. They, these components, sorry, these constituents share a component. AB has A in common with AB prime. AB has B in common with A prime B. They are antagonists. You realize easily that in a closed system, if AB increases for some reason, it can only increase by destroying AB prime and A prime B to make more AB. These are antagonists. But now the most interesting is not this. The most interesting is that if you look at the diagonals of this network, as you can see here, AB is diagonally linked by B prime. This positioning I have shown, I wanted as this is especially to show the relationship. So if AB increases, it liberates A prime and B prime from the two other constituents. This A prime and B prime can form A prime B prime. In other words, as AB increases, there is more and more A prime and B prime, which can form A prime B prime. If AB increases, therefore A prime B prime is also can or must also increase if they react with one another. And these are agonists. They're agonists meaning that they act together. So you can then uh, have adaptation in a, react, in a reaction to effectors. But the most important thing, and this will come again, you have something, a property which is of great importance, which I like to call agonist amplification. Suppose that AB is the fittest for a given property. The fact that this thing is amplified drives also amplification of the unfittest for that property, but maybe the unfittest is interesting for something else. So if AB increases for some reason due to a given agent, A prime pre prime will also increase. And this is now an adaptive chemical network because when one thing changes, the other ones will change too, in a way which is regulated by antagonistic connectivity and, ag and, and agonistic connectivities. 
Um, yeah, uh, let me just very quickly show you that. If you have here four ligands and you add a metal ion, the metal ion will preferentially bind to the best ligand. The best ligand is the one which has N, N, O. In addition, if you add the base, the N and the AB here can also ionize and form then this ligand uh, with an ionization, uh, the nitrogen, which gives a very strong complex. Huh? This is now a complex between a tridentate ligand as an ionized and ionized ligands, giving then this very strong complex. The result is that you drive the system to generate only the one which binds the middle ion and the one which cannot bind the middle ion, the one which is the least able to bind the middle ion. So this is the quaternion, this, uh, this unit with four uh, constituents, uh, usually here, represented schematically. If you add the effector, the middle ion, you have a strong amplification. You have a very, very strong amplification of the AB, which binds the middle ion, which leads to the amplification of A prime, B prime. And the other ones almost disappear. I have only represented them here for just for reference. That's another notation. And again, I insist, the fittest for coordination with the middle ion amplifies also the one which is unfittest, the A prime, B prime. It's the one which has the smallest number, the, the, the least uh, ability to bind the middle ion. Now, um, we can now try to uh, have dynamic systems where the self-organization of the supramolecular material will drive the system. So, well, how does that, what does that mean? That means that we will have a system where the constitution is always changing, it can change all the time, dynamic in its constitution. But when one entity in that system can self-organize, it will drive the selection, it will adapt the system to that self-organization. It becomes clearer when I tell you in a moment. So it combines supramolecular features, supramolecular dynamics, H-bonds, for instance, with molecular dynamics, imines, for instance, but there can be others, of course. So the question we can ask is then very interesting. Is it really possible that constitutional dynamic materials will generate their own constituents? In other words, that the drive to form a material of a given type will drive its own formation. That would be very interesting. So, and even could the function of one of these materials in this mixture of possibilities drive the selection of the components which generate a constituent which has a function, which has that function? This is a very, this could be very interesting. In other words, it would mean that the system is. Uh, the system is um, generating, is driven by the function it can generate. Not only is the nature of the constitution of the material generated, but even the function would be generated. So that would mean, can one make self-generation of functional materials? That would be very interesting. It would be a sort of a system where the fact that something can go towards a given evolution, towards adaptation, it will automatically select what it needs to do that. So what does it then come to? Yeah, they should not be there. Okay, anyway, uh, what is happening then is the following. We go back to these guanine quartets. We have at the beginning, a guanosine hydrazine. This is the same as the one which normally gives uh, the G quartets, except that now it's a guanosine, which has been modified by introducing here a hydrazine on, the, on, the, on the, the acid group, which has been made here. So this is changed by the, with the normal primary alcohol CH2OH has been oxidized to the acid, and then the acid has been condensed with hydrazine. 
Now, this can undergo what we have already seen, the formation of a G quartet, and they can then stack, stack these disks can then stack on top of each other. To show you that, indeed, you get then a gel. The temp picture here shows that a very nice gel is formed, and you can see it here in the tube. So, indeed, what I wanted just to show here is that this guanosine 5 prime hydrazide is able to form a supramolecular hydrogel on the basis of cheek of quartet, guanine quartet formation, and then forming a, a columnar, a column of stacked supramolecular macrocycles, G quartets, leading to the formation of a gel. So I repeat, we go from the guanosine hydrazide to the gel by formation of a G quartet, and this is the important thing to retain. Now, here we have, in fact, a triple dynamic system. Let's analyze it. First of all, the guanine hydrazide, guanosine hydrazide, can form the G quartet by hydrogen bonding. That is a non-covalent, a supramolecular non-covalent organic dynamic feature, organic, because it happens by hydrogen bonding. Then, if we add a metal ion which stabilizes the quartet, we have a supramolecular non-covalent and inorganic dynamics, a metal cation binding. And finally, we can react aldehydes with these NH2 groups here, and then we get covalent dynamics, reversible imine formation. So we have, I summarize again, supramolecular organic dynamics, hydrogen bonding, supramolecular inorganic dynamics, metal ion binding, molecular dynamics, reversible imine formation. Now, the imines can be different. And here, we I show you four of the imines we have tried. It happens that two of these imines, the first at the beginning here, the disulfonate and the monosulfonate, at the given, okay, we have always to be in the same conditions, of course. So at 15 millimolar concentration, if we derivatize, if we attach to that NH2, these two groups, then we get a solution. If we add the desionate derived from furan, and this is the most interesting one, derived from pyridoxal phosphate, which is a, a, a biological compound, then we get a better, in fact, a better gel. A gel, what I mean by a better gel is a gel with a higher melting point. So, first of all, we see that we have formation of either a sol or a gel, depending on what is attached. So now the interesting question is, if a gel can be formed, does the system select the constituent which leads to the gel? Does the system drive to the formation of the best gel? That would be very interesting. So we can show it in the following way. If we mix together now the guanosine hydrazide together with another hydrazide here, which uh, is an amino acid, hydrazide, styrene hydrazide here. Okay? And we have two aldehydes. The aldehyde, which is a sulfonate, a benzene sulfonate, which we have seen here, we have seen here, this is the benzene sulfonate, which should in principle give a solution. Huh? We know that this when it's alone gives a solution. And we have also the pyridoxal one here, which gives a good gel, a bit a stable gel. So what happens? Now you mix these four, and now the system has to choose what it wants to do. The thermodynamics, since you know very well, the thermodynamics drive our universe. Huh? We are thermodynamic objects. We exist because of thermodynamics. So the, the thermodynamics drives the system. What is happening? What is happening is the following. You mix these four and you analyze the result. The result is you get a gel and, of course, a sol. The water is still present. The water is in the interstices between the gel molecules. If you measure the NMR spectrum, 
what is in the water dis dissolved in the water has sharp signals. So you can analyze it and you see, you find that in the solution, there are the combinations A, B prime, A prime, B prime, and A prime, B. That means the combinations are this one with this, which is, in the, which is sol, we know that from the pre previous uh, experiment, and A prime, B prime, and A B, all these are sol. But in the gel, you have a gel. So what is in the gel? It can only be what is not in the sol, of course. And indeed, that is what is in the gel. A, B is in the gel. What does that mean? First of all, that the simple mixing together of these four components, knowing that one of, of which one constituent can give a gel, automatically selects and amplifies the one which gives the best gel. You can see it here. The distribution is an enforced distribution. A, B prime, A prime, B, with A, B and A prime, B prime. A, B is a gel, but as a consequence, by agonistic, agonistic amplification, if A, B increases because it's forced to do so by forming of the gel, of course, A prime, B prime has also been increased. So the formation of the gel leads to amplification of the concept A, B, and together with the other ones, and the, of course, the amplification of the agonist, A prime, B prime. What is amplified is the one which is leading to gel formation. Now, we can even calculate the gelation driving force because at the beginning, in absence of that, that should be statistical. The fact that it is not statistical means that there's a force, uh, organization force, and this driving force is about one kilocalorie. You can, you can calculate by the ratio between this as about 10% here, about 40% there. This is now a selection under the pressure, so to say, under the driving force, under the driving force of self-organization. Now, I would like, so this is just a representation very, very quickly. At the beginning, you have just statistical distribution. The gel formation leads to an enforced distribution, an organized state which is self-organization. Here we have more statistical. Self-organization drives component selection and amplification of that component, which forms a gel. And this is now, again, an adaptation to the fact that you want to, the system wants to form a self-organized gel. Agonist amplification, the fittest drives the amplification of the unfittest. I like this. This is very important. And this is why I'm insisting very much on it. And this is also something you do maybe with prebiotic evolution of matter. I haven't time to get much into that, but if you think about it, it's quite clear. Now, um, the, uh, that I will finish now with two more examples, and then we are finished. Um, yeah, I should cite also that a number of uh, Chinese co-workers have been here, and they have uh, worked on this field, and I will show you some of the work. So... We have this discovered together. This was, in fact, a sort of an Asian combination. There was a, a, a co-worker, a lady from Thailand, who worked on this, and then there were two. There were Chinese co-workers also. This was, first of all, a, a new type of uh, uh, dynamic process, dynamic covalent process, which was an organic metathesis. I haven't time to get much into it, but when you mix a Knoevenagel compound like K here with an imine like this I here, they can exchange their uh, components. That means this unit here, if you see my mouse, can then exchange for this unit, sorry, for this unit here and exchange these two components. Now, one of these, of the four units possible, K I prime, K prime I, can form a gel, this one. So what is going on then? What is going on is the following. The, uh, the gel formation leads to the amplification of, I. again, I should say that what you can quantify by NMR is the integration of the signals which you see. And of course, if you integrate I, you know exactly because I prime is the 
and uh, they, sorry, if you integrate I, its antagonist, its agonist has the same proportion as I, and so on. So, in fact, when you integrate I, and you can also see the other ones, you can exactly know what is in the gel. In the gel is K prime. So you can analyze the whole system together. When you form the gel, you amplify I, which is not in the gel. I is in the solution. And you rep repress, you down-regulate I prime, because I prime, one piece of I prime, the one which bears I here, the R here, R is uh, 1633, long, long chain, is in the gel. Now you heat it, then the gel melts and gives a solution. And then you go back to the statistical distribution. And then you cool it down again to form a gel at 22 degrees. And now you get again the same. In other words, the heating, cooling, heating, cooling, which is the way in which you go from organization in the gel to non-organization in the solution, makes the system select reversibly what it needs. It, it selects reversibly. And of course, in the solution state, it's just uh, statistical. So there is, again, component selection under the pressure of organization. This was done by uh, Chu Chuan Yang and uh, Xian An Kuchat. She is, of course, a Chinese. She is, uh, these were three ladies. This is um, uh, the Thailand, from Thailand, the co-worker from Thailand. And she made Chiang, uh, of course, uh, she knows her very well because she's at Jilin University now. So um, this is the description in terms of uh, you know, just schematic. At the beginning, you have 20, you have 25 percent of each. You go to the gel state. You have a strong amplification of the one which forms a gel, K prime here, 40 percent, and of course, as a consequence, I is also 40 percent. And then you go, you heat to the solution state, and you get again 25 percent um, distribution. The, the, again, the driving force is very close to this uh, thing. This perhaps means something because we have seen in the previous system that we have about a one kilocolor. This is the gel forming constituent, which then leads to this. Uh, here is just a representation in terms of a network. I can go quickly over that. Statistical, strong amplification by the organization. And then again, statistical Again, agonist amplification, the fittest for gel formation drives the other one, adaptation to the organized phase. And this is now the important conclusion, which I will have in the last example also, but in a more clear way even. The self-organization drives the selection of these components, which reinforce the organization. In other words, it's a self-amplification of organization, which is, tells, us, uh, tells us a lot. We come back to that. So now for the, uh, the, my last uh, Chinese, of course, I have several others Chinese co-workers who did not work in this field, but Ri Ri Gu, who just got, uh, I think he gets a position now in Shanghai, uh, has this system which I now will describe. That's the last thing I describe. So that's a self-organization, again, where we couple, like in the previous one, CCCN organometatasis with the um, uh, with self-organization. But here, it's a two-step self-organization, two-step supramolecular polymer. And in addition, all the parameters have been quantified. In other words, in the previous thing, I have just told you, we get a gel, we can melt it, and we can go between solution, gel, solution, gel, depending on temperature. But in this case, we have quantified the order order by looking at the NMR broadening of the peaks. And the NMR broadening is directly related to the viscosity of the medium. So what is, the, what is going on here? It's a system where we start with units, uh, the Knovenagel compound again, CC component exchange, as we have already seen it, by CCCN organometatasis between a Knovenagel compound and an imine. So they can exchange their components as we have already seen. The first step then, because we have this unit, which is this uh, Knovenagel compound, we can form a rosette like the ones we have seen very early in my talk, which has been used 
also by, um, uh, by David Reinhardt in the Netherlands for making his rosettes many, many years ago. So this is now well established and we, have, we had also worked on sims of that kind, hexamers, rosette, which are hexameric macrocycle, six molecules go together, they are not quartets, they are hextets if you want, or they are sex, sextets, I should say, uh, not quartets, by sextets, where you form this, what has been called a rosette. Now, these rosettes form a disc, and these discs can stack. And this is uh, sort of an artist representation of the columnar supramolecular polymer, which is formed by stacking. So we have two, we have a first possibility where we have a um, dynamic covalent recombination between glomerulonuclear regions and imines. They generate four possibilities. One of these possibilities forms preferentially this rosette, and then this rosette, when it is formed, it's again a sequential uh, process, can stack to form the columnar supramolecular polymer. Okay. Now, what happens is shown here. If we look now at the uh, state of the material, we can modify this by changing the solvent, a mixed solvent, chloroform cyclohexane D12, and by changing the temperature. And you can see in this graphic that every time we have a gel, we have a strong, sorry, we have a strong selection for the unit which gives the best, which gives the gel. When it is changed in solvent, as the, um, the uh, chloroform increases down here, or up here, you have the cyclohexane increase, then, of course, chloroform is a better solvent than cyclohexane. So you have a more or less statistic distribution as long as you have a gel, a sol. And when you go over to the gel, of course, progressively, you go to a distribution, which is more and more and more a distribution of the gel. Temperature, when you heat up, the same thing happens. But, of course, at a different temperature, you keep the statistical distribution longer. Um, and uh, sorry, yeah, here, uh, this is at the lower temperature. You, the statistical distribution is, is at the lower temperature. It has less chloroform here. And when the chloroform then is 30%, here the chloroform was 20%, 30%, you already have a gel and you have this domain which is a gel domain. So when you change, when you decrease the temperature, you have a much better chance to get a gel, of course. So you can mix, you can see here that indeed you, you can see the gel and you can then look at it. Now, this is a bit complicated perhaps, uh, but what it means, let me just show you that we here, uh, we measured line widths in proton NMR, and the line widths are, collect, are directly related to the, let's say, the mobility or the, 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 the organization of the gel, like also to viscosity. And we can, maybe the most impressive one is if you have um, a monoconstituent, just this monoconstituent is KN1 on top here. That is a single constituent, so that does not form a gel. And then when you go to the, to the uh, KN3, this one, this forms a gel. This can form a gel. You mix them, and you see that if you compare the line, line widths here, remain stable. And when you form a gel, of course, and when you form the gel, then the line width gets much bigger. And this then leads to the selection, as you see in the other. I haven't time to get into all that. It's, it's a bit complicated, perhaps, this uh, picture. But uh, it, the line widths confirm that as long as you retain the gel, you have the selection. And when you go to the solution, you get towards the statistical distribution. Of course, it is not, it is not just at one degree, as you can see here. It takes a little time. For instance, if you look at the 293K case, 
Uh, here we have still 21, 21, 29, 29, and then we go to 16, 6, 6, and 44, 44. In other words, it's a, it's a, it's a curve which goes progressively towards more and more organization. But it proves that gel and sol uh, have a different uh, behavior, and gel leads to selection. So the conclusions of that, it's again this very important thing, self-amplification of organization. The formation, when the system is in conditions where gel can form, the systems amplifies, it generates, it amplifies preferentially that constituent which forms the gel. That means the system automatically amplifies what leads to organization. It's a self-amplification of organization. This is, I think, very important, not just in chemistry, not just in this case, that's a specific case, but it should be considered as a general property of matter. When material objects are mixed together, they, if they can exchange their pieces, of course, then they will recombine and do everything they can in order to generate what has the better organization. And I think that is driving, it's a major driving force in the evolution of complex matter. So, okay, adaptation leads to selection, you get the adaptive materials, and this leads then to supramolecular and molecular in the future, more and more ad application towards functional materials and technologies. And let me summarize by this graph I often use, evolution of materials from molecular materials to supramolecular materials. That's what we were talking about by, uh, and then trying to understand what is organization doing there? What is organization uh, uh, connected to dynamics giving? Then it can adapt. And this adaptation is a very important property. It's in this case, as you notice, it's a thermodynamic equilibrating adaptation. Living systems have another property that they can adapt in non-equilibrium conditions. And that is now a next frontier of this complex materials chemistry where we would operate also out of equilibrium towards more and more complex materials. So that's it. I think I have now been talking an hour and a half, and that's enough. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Great talk as always. It's time for questions and answers. The first question comes from uh, Professor Cao Yi. Nanjing University. In case of uh, self-organization driven constitutional dynamic systems, do you think the gel, so gel phase separation plays an even more important role than self-assembly? Uh, more important role than self-assembly? Self -assembly. For example, yeah. if the self-assembled product is a supermolecular polymer instead of gel, can you still see the self-organization driven constitutional dynamics? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Is that indeed, if the, I would say, if the um, object at the end, the organized object is more organized than a gel, that one will win and will drive even further. In other words, if indeed one can get, um, a gel is a rather soft matter, or let's say, that one can say the following. One can have gels, and we have a case like that. When we, you can have gels, and gels can be characterized in their uh, uh, stability, so to say, by temperature. The melting point of a gel gives you an idea of how tough, how uh, solid the gel is. So gels which have a higher melting point are formed preferentially to gels with a lower melting point. And now the question which is asked, indeed, if 
it is a self, if it is a forming um, a polymer, which has, a, or a, yeah, yeah, polymer or an organized entity, which is maybe even a solid, a precipitation. Precipitation is, of course, the ultimate. That is the largest what you can do. I think then, indeed, you will have an even a better organization and you have a stronger driving force. If the end product is more um, organized, you have a stronger driving force and then that will win. And it could be a supramolecular polymer, it could be a supramolecular column, for instance, <clears throat> which is the case in the last, the last case was a column. But it is okay, we have seen, in fact, you know, if I go back, let me just I keep my picture. If I go back to what is the work done by Wilwigu, um, is uh, then uh, you see here is 6% and 40% before it was less good. It was about 10, 11% and uh, here uh, uh, less than 40%. So I think uh, indeed there's, there is something here already uh, that yeah. this organization here is better than in the case where we had uh, the other gels. But this is still a gel. Mm. Maybe, I think, maybe one should do one thing, and this we should do. If we, we listens, maybe he's listening. <laughs> he could take this and then cool it down so that it precipitates. And then it should be even much stronger. Mm. And we, we, if you listen, you yeah. should do that if you have the okay. compound still. <laughs> okay. The second... So the second question is from Professor Sung Bo in uh, Suzhou University. In uh, 2005, a science paper raised 125 important scientific questions. The only question related to chemistry is how far can self-assembly go? Now, six, 16 years passed, do you have an answer to it? How far can self assembly go? <laughs> yeah, I have an answer, a very simple one, but it's it doesn't mean doesn't mean much. Self organization can go as at least as far as what we are. Human beings are self organized. Uh, we have a self organized system. I I, I really think that self organization is a driving force of complexity in our universe. So. Self-organization can go all the way to the generation of a human being. See, now this mm. is a bit philosophical also, yeah. but uh, it's my answer to the question. Mm. Yeah. So, and of course, it's stepwise, you know. It is not at the beginning, it's very simple. At the beginning, you have just two objects going together. But as they, uh, in a, a, again, in a very trivial fashion, the very first supermolecular polymer, which went from molecules to a supermolecular chain to a triple helix and then to fibers, that's already on the way to more and more complexity. Of course, we are miles and miles and hundreds, millions of miles away from a orga living organism and thinking organism. But in, along the way, we get more and more properties, new and new ones. It is just, uh, we are far from it for the moment, but my impression is that self-organization drives complexity in our universe, and we are part of that complexity. Yeah. So one more question from uh, Dr. Chen Mengjiao uh, from uh, Beijing University of uh, Chemical Technology. Her question is, uh, the self-adaptation network seems close to the complex working mechanism of life system, but how to balance molecular dynamics and assembly precession? In other words, it is possible to realize challenging tasks such as DNA mismatch repair in DNA replication. Oh, yeah, that would be very interesting. Yeah, I think one can imagine it. In fact, um, what nature does in terms of uh, mis mismatch, mismatch, it corrects mismatch by enzymes. Huh? Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, when there are errors in DNA in the double helix, there are some enzymes which come around, they detect the error, they, they, um, they kick, they, uh, 
uh, like scissors, they cut out the one which is wrong and they put the, the good one back. So this is enzyme. That's a complicated process. It's a sort of an error correcting process. Normally, uh, it's a question, and this is still something which it's a, yeah, it raises an interesting question. Suppose you have let's two two uh, DNA chains which are complementary, and then comes a chain which is not exactly complementary to the. You have number one, and it's complement number two. And then you add number three, which is not exactly compar uh, comparable to number one. If number three binds to one, then two will come around and displace number, sorry, three will come around and displace number two, which is the bad one. Excuse me, I have mixed up six. Number one is the start. Number two is the complement. Number three is the new one, which is not totally complementary. If you start with one and three, then when two comes, it will displace three to have the best complement. But all this is just thermodynamics. So it may not be very efficient. And uh, here we need all these things which are in living organisms. We need uh, good self-sorting. We need thermodynamics. We need out of equilibrium systems with amplification. Uh, this is a very, very complicated story. And probably in out of equilibrium systems, you will have larger effects than what you have in simply equilibrium systems. And possibly evolution generated all the correcting enzymes because the simple equilibrium thermodynamics were not enough to correct. Then you needed something to do the job to cut out the wrong base, for instance, and to put in the good one. Mm. So... Another question is from uh, Dr. Yang Liuling in Xiamen University. As uh, Professor Lan mentioned, as you mentioned many years ago, supermolecular chemistry became the chemistry of molecular information. Would you please talk a little bit about the role of information in molecular self-assembly? How do you think about the introduction of information theory into the study of molecular self-assembly? Well, that's a very basic question. It's a very important one. Let's say, first of all, in very general terms, one can consider that any molecule contains information by its structure, the type of atoms, the shape, and all that. And this is, for instance, a DNA strand, one strand of DNA, is an informed object where the letters are the famous AGTC letters. Then, of course, um, this information, how can one define it? How can one quantify? One can say uh, that when two things do not bind, there is little reason, there's no, they don't read the information. When they bind very strongly, there is strong information, so to say. And then the question comes up, what is, how can you measure that information? Um, the best way, I think, is KT. Suppose you have an object A and its complement B in solution. Let's take a solution. At room temperature, suppose they are separate. If you cool down, they may bind together. So then they have an interaction. If you heat it up, they will not bind. So for information scientists, that's a, a strange concept, but I, can, I have some information scientists who thought about that. So I, could, I would say that perhaps an information bit, a molecular, I say a chemical information measurement, a bit, could be KT. Uh, KT, KT is temperature dependent, and KT could be what we, use, we could use at a given temperature as measuring the information. So many KTs is so much information. This I wrote already in my book in 1995, that KT could be used as an information bit for 
molecular and supramolecular processes. Now, this can lead to information scientists jumping up and say, this is not true, information is something out of matter and so on. One of the, there's a very famous, I just don't remember the name now, but it's in, in one of my papers, um, computer scientist, very well known, he said, uh, information is a question of, um, of energy also, that information and energy are linked together. And let me show you, uh, this is, uh, I, should, I should try to find the name of that film. Um, just escapes my name. Uh, I think it is my paper in Angewandte Chemie 2013. There's a reference to that person. Angewandte Chemie paper is a review paper in 2013. So he said that. And of course, look, I can give you a trivial example. You have a nice computer, Okay. You store a lot of information in your PC, your personal computer. If you heat it up, it will destroy. So energy is linked to information. If you burn your computer, there is no information anymore. When we die, our brain decomposes and all the information stored for a whole lifetime in our brain is gone, finished. So uh, this is it's strictly it's linked together. Okay, so I think uh, let me take a last question from uh, Dr. Huang Zhehuan, a postdoc at Cambridge University, UK. Does uh, binding kinetics play the same role as uh, binding thermodynamics in uh, dynamic functional materials? How could we study binding kinetics within these materials? How would the uh, binding is, kinetics influence material properties and their related applications? This is a very important question. In fact, it makes me some, to say something I did not mention. That what I told you today has, of course, depends on kinetics. At a given time, in the, in the, as the system reaches more and more organization and so on, of course, that's a kinetic process. So I have usually tried to look at the time where it is more or less in thermodynamic endpoint equilibrium. But it is true that, of course, kinetics are very important. And kinetics, they, of course, if you stop on the way somewhere, or if the kinetics are very slow, you get new things. One of my uh, Chinese co-workers also, Dr. He Meixia, she worked on kinetics changes in the networks, how they change and where at the beginning a network can be one way and at the equilibrium it is another way. So that was a case where kinetics influenced the way in which the network was represented. And this is very important. Uh, I have not said much about it. Yeah, I could have. We have not studied too much, but the work I mentioned was was one of them, and the other we have some other uh, some other uh, possibilities. But it's true that usually we were looking for the equi equilibrium position. Kinetics are very important, and uh, uh, there is another yeah another paper I can mention is that we have a paper on training a system. Uh, that's a paper by Jan Holup from one of my former co-workers also, uh, was from some years ago, where they, let me just mention the, the, the principle. If you have a system which undergoes equilibration, but slow equilibration, then you put in an object A, or just an effector E, you put in an effector then the effector will influence the distribution in the system. Uh, but this will happen slowly because, by principle, we have chosen slow kinetics. So progressively, you have to wait. The thing will equilibrate. And the distribution of the components and the type of constituents which are generated will 
then change until it has reached equilibrium. Then you take this, what you have added, this effector out. The system at the beginning, because the kinetics of exchange are slow, will keep the same distribution. And if you now add the same effector back, it will immediately be recognized. Huh? Because at the beginning, you do an imprinting. I start again. When the system is equilibrating slowly, you add an effector, the effector imprints into the system a given distribution. You take it away, this distribution will be kept. It will slowly degree, de decrease depending on the kinetics, but it will be kept for some time and less and less and less good, of course. The memory progressively disappears. And then if you put the new effector back, it will immediately be recognized. If you wait too long, or if you heat the system to equilibrium, of course, then you go back to point zero. So the question was, thank you for the question, because it's very important that I mentioned these kinetic problems. They are obviously very important. Uh, and there's the question of also, if it's slow, it takes a long time. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it, everything is linked. <laughs> Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Wonderful talk always induces wonderful questions. But I have to close the first my talk because of the time. Uh, thanks. Oh, yeah, it's midnight. Uh, everyone it's, it's for midnight. kind of attention. Have a nice weekend. Uh, what, what time is it now? 16, 20, 22. Uh, yeah. Almost uh, uh, 8 minutes to 11. In Beijing time. In Beijing. Okay. All right. Have a good <laughs> night. Sleep well. <laughs> and everybody ah, will... regard to your wife. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have to tell you something. But not here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye.